Every family, of course, has some of their own different traditions this time of year. And so there may be some exception to what, what I'm about to say. But I think for most people, uh, would, would they miss Thanksgiving dinner with, with their family uh, to take their children to ball practice, to a game, to camp, to hunt, to fish, to go to a, a concert, to, to visit, visit some friend who was in town who declined the invitation to come join your family? Uh, most people <clears throat> value the occasion and the people of that occasion uh, so that, that that would not be a trade-off that they would consider. And again, there may be some exceptions to different habits and practices granted. In some ways, tonight I want to think about the, the Lord's Day as a Thanksgiving day. Now, of course, the turkey and the potatoes and such things, but a day where God's family gathers in from place to place in person uh, but if we think of it uh, of the body of Christ all over the world even though they're not in the same place all are gathering before the Lord and so in that sense God's family is gathered together and maybe not the only purpose but think about the one of the purpose of the Lord's Day as a thanksgiving day let me just review or just remind us, though, a little bit about the Lord's Day. Uh, if we look in American history and some of the, the declarations of some presidents, that, that's, who makes, that's who has made Thanksgiving Day official in our nation. So who is it that made a declaration that there is a day called the Lord's Day? In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, it, it really isn't the emphasis of John's writing He's just giving a little bit of detail about the things he's about to tell him that he saw and heard. So it's, it's almost in passing that John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And then he goes on and he doesn't stop to say when the Lord's Day is because the people that he's writing to already know. But if you were reading Revelation for the first time, then you might stop and say, well, John, I, I don't know when, when the Lord's Day is. And so as we have questions from time to time, as we read, we go and we dig a little bit, maybe use a concordance, or we find some way to find out, well, I need some more information on when that would be. And part of that challenge is there is no other verse in the Bible that uses this phrase. This is the only passage that uses the, the terms, the Lord's Day. You might find the Day of the Lord in other verses, but that, that's something clearly completely different than this. So if we go back in Scripture, uh, there, there's really only one possibility as we look at the, the, the covenant of the Lord, the new covenant in the New Testament. There's only one day that is, is highlighted, that is, given of, that is given any significance or importance to Christians. I'm not going to read all of these verses now. We'll look, look at some of them later. But you, you may recognize Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John at the end of them. They're talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And it's interesting that each one of them described the timing of that in, as the first day of the week. One reason that's interesting is that usually Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John don't talk about the same things. You've noticed that. When they do talk about the same things, they usually don't give all of the same details. And even if they give the same details, they word it a little bit differently. But in this case, they all describe the timing in exactly the same way the first day of the week. And then Luke writes about that in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, refers to the, the first day of the week. Paul does so in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. And you can do your own study of the rest of the New Testament to find out for yourself. But in my study, that is the only day that I can find that is given any significance for all Christians uh, throughout the New Testament. Uh, some people may be surprised to realize they're there is no day called Christmas anywhere in Scripture. There's no day called Easter anywhere in Scripture. But there is this day called the Lord's Day. So what are the candidates for the, what are the possibilities for the day that John's referring to? Well, it's, it's simplified in this way. There's, there's only one. It's the first day of the week. So then if we haven't thought about this before, or if we're just going to review it, well, why is it that the Lord's Day is the first day of the week. 
Because in these verses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all talk about the, the resurrection of Jesus. But Acts chapter 20, verse 7 doesn't say anything about Jesus' resurrection. It talks about disciples meeting to break bread and the Word of God is taught. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul talks about giving on the first day of the week. So, why is the first day called the Lord's Day? Well, if we, if we took all of the details that are mentioned in all of these verses, the resurrection of Jesus, the disciples gathering, breaking bread, the preaching of the Word, giving, well, all of those are important because they are from God, but would, would any of those say, well, the, there's something that is a little more foundational. It, it needed to be true for these other things to be true. And so, not just numerically, but I think in significance, we would all see, well, if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, then I don't think Christians are gathering. I don't think they're going to be breaking bread, uh, that they're going to be giving. The, the resurrection of Christ is foundational among all of these truths. And so, the, the first day of the week is called the Lord's Day, because that's the day that Jesus arose from the dead, that, that's uh, among the foundation, a part of the foundation of our hope. That doesn't mean any other event in the life of Jesus is less important, but it is of significance. God picked that same that day to identify it and to be called the Lord's Day. So we could say that the, the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, is a memorial. It's a memorial of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now think about some different kinds of memorials or, or ways uh, that, that certain events are, are uh, preserved. The memory of those events are preserved. Uh, sometimes there might be an object. So maybe you've been to the Washington Memorial. So sometimes there's, there's an object that's built. And so by, by seeing that, regardless of what time of year you're there, when you see it, then that brings back to your memory some occasion or some event that took place there. In, in Joshua chapter 4, I won't turn and read it, but when the Israelites crossed the Jordan River to go into the land that God had promised, God said, put 12 stones there so that when you, you come, you, you'll remember how you came into the land. God miraculously brought them in. In America today, we would probably put an explanatory plaque on the, on the rocks there, a, a landmark to explain, well, here's why these are there and here, here is what happened. Other memorials, though, don't, don't have an object, but often a day is chosen to, to keep some event in memory. Um, and then often there will be an activity associated with the day. So it isn't just waking up on that day and, oh yeah, this is that day, and then I go about my business, but an event that goes with the day. And so if you live in a place that uh, actually has darkness on July 4th, then a lot of times there's fireworks on July 4th. There's the day. And then there's different, there's other ceremonies or things, some activity to mark the day. For good reason, of course, that not too typical here. Uh, in Israel, they had days like that where God marked the day. But it, again, it wasn't just the day. The day would be brought to their, would bring the past to their mind. But then often they would have to travel to Jerusalem. They would go to the temple or the tabernacle, but then they had to go to the priests. And then when they were with the priest, they were worshiping God. Worship was the common activity when there were holy days, days that God was marking as a memorial of some event of the past. And so you have the Passover or the Feast of Tabernacles and other occasions in, under the, the Old Covenant. So what, what kind of a memorial is the first day of the week, the Lord's Day? Uh, there's, we don't know where Jesus was raised. We don't know where that tomb is. Uh, so God didn't make, mark the memorial that way by the place. Uh, God marked it by the day. But like other activities, it isn't just the day, or like other memorials, it isn't just the day. God has then given an activity on the day to help to preserve the memory of that past event on that day. So what would be the activity of the Lord's Day to mark the resurrection of Jesus Christ? In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, we'll, we'll read those two verses and we'll enter them into the record here. 
in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, again, with, without, without reading Matthew through John, if someone just started reading in the book of Acts, you, we, I would probably read right over uh, the detail that Luke mentions here, that it was on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. And Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Uh, but if we include the background to that, does it, does it affect this verse at all? If, if, it, if we were to think of, on the Lord's day, the disciples came together to break bread. And that, that's exactly what Luke is doing here. He's not just randomly choosing the day of the week on which Paul was there. He's saying it on the same day that Jesus arose from the dead, the disciples gathered together, and then there were some activities on that day, breaking bread, and there was the, the teaching of the Word. Yeah, breaking bread being, of course, a, a different memorial of a different event, Jesus' death. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, again, if, if you were just reading this chapter for the first time, it, it might seem like a meaningless detail, but with the background we know it's, it's nothing, there's nothing meaningless when Paul says, on the first day of the week, uh, the New American Standard here maybe is the most plain and clear, uh, by saying on the first day of every week. That, that's implied regardless of the translation, but that, that's the point. But Paul was telling them on the first day of every week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. It, it's, it's not insignificant that do this on the Lord's day. Or think of it this way, what if Paul had written, on the day that Jesus arose from the dead, lay something aside, as you, as you may prosper. That adds a, another layer of, of meaning to not just the activity to give or to break bread, but to the background of the context of the day on which those things were done. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. So there are these activities to participate in on the first day of the week, on the Lord's day, that's consistent with, you know, that's consistent with the nature of really memorials. That again, maybe on the day you were born, you blow out some fire, you open up some boxes. They're just typical events that we do, in addition to the day in which they are done. Hebrews ten verse nineteen says, "Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest." by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. He's, he's using clearly some Old Testament references, but here, here going into the holiest. So that's talking about the, the holiest place. That's just a, a throwback to the language of the temple, but... The holiest place in Israel was a symbol of God's presence. And so he's using Old Covenant language to describe what we do in the New Covenant. He's saying, go into the presence of God, but you can only go in with the blood of Christ. They would go in with the blood of an animal. But he says, you go in with the blood of Christ through His flesh, and then you get to go in even though you're not the high priest. In the Old Covenant, only a high priest, not even the normal priest, could go in. But he's saying, brethren, all of you, the high priest will escort you in to the presence of God. And then in verse 22, when he says, let us draw near, that's not just the idea of, well, I want to be more like God. That, that's true, but this is the language of worship. And what, what else would you do if you went into the presence of God, the holiest place, and if you were escorted by the high priest, in this case Jesus Christ, if in some physical, literal sense you could walk behind Jesus and He would walk you into the presence of the Father, what do you think would be the first thing that you would do if, if you have your mind about you? You would worship. And that's what John is describing here. He's, talking, he's describing worship. Now this, of course, isn't specifically describing the Lord's Day. But these other passages make, make that connection for us. And so what would be the activity of the memorial 
of the day that Jesus arose from the dead in a general way. It's, it's worship. In verses 24 and 25, though, we, we, under normal circumstances, we don't even go in bef- to draw near to God alone. Verse 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Of course, consistent with our abilities, though, picture this again. It's like we're we're meeting with other priests. Jesus is the high priest. Uh, he's, He's the only one who is the mediator. And so we don't have to go to an earthly priest to get access into the holiest place. But if you keep that old covenant imagery here, he's saying, on, he's saying, gather with the other priests and follow the high priest into the holiest place, into the presence of God, and worship Him. That, that fits the language of a memorial. The day is marked, and then the activities are marked. But what's, what's the point of the day? of the memorial and of the activities. In a sense, it's a, it's a history lesson, of course. A memorial is intended to call to your mind so that you remember what, what happened long ago in a, in a place far away or near away or, ne- or nearby. Uh, but isn't it something a little bit more than that? Uh, not just to remember maybe that you were born, but then there, there's a reason for that. Usually Hopefully, some, some joy that you've been given life another year. Or if it's July 4th, to maybe remember the people all throughout history who have contributed to whatever you have on that day. The, the point is a memorial is not just to help us remember, but then it's to provoke some kind of a response to us that, well, since that happened, well, then now I should fill in the blank. So what would be the response? What would be the proper response to and even though it may be a challenge because it happens every seven days, uh, but, but of attending, uh, attending to a, an object that was a memorial of the, the most significant event in human history. Uh, because of the repetition, you might have to challenge yourself to keep it fresh and, and meaningful every time. But if it really was the most significant event in hu- human history, then every time you went there, it, it would be worth being impressed with being reminded. And so the memorial of, of Jesus' resurrection is, yes, so that we remember that it happened. But then, of course, we're supposed to remember that it happened so that we respond to that in some way. And what's the right response uh, to, to knowing and being reminded again and again and again that Jesus arose from the dead? I don't know how to summarize the answer to that in, in one sentence, but Paul describes what Paul says here is, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And here he's not talking about the Lord's day, but he is talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And so I I think that's the beginning place at least. What's the response to the remembrance that Jesus arose from the dead in a way no one had ever been, no one had ever risen from the dead before? Lazarus had risen from the dead, but we don't mark that day because he had to be raised from the dead. Jesus raised himself from the dead. The Father and the Spirit cooperating and working together, but Jesus had a part in that as well. And so among the proper responses to the memory of Jesus' resurrection, to the, the memorial of his resurrection, is of course giving thanks, not just being thankful that it happened, but even in the language of our American holiday, it isn't thanks day, it's thanksgiving day. And so think about the Lord's day in, in that sense, that the Lord's day, when we give thanks in song on the Lord's day, that's a part of what makes it thanksgiving day, because we are giving something, we're giving these words that we offer from our hearts. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, this this also is is not exclusive or limited to the Lord's Day, but it it talks about what we would do together to one another, so it would be included on this occasion. 
Ephesians 5, verse 18, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. So again, giving thanks always in all things, but what he tied that on this occasion to, at the least it includes the singing that we do to one another. And so expressing thanks is, is whether it's spiritual songs or even a variety of other songs. That, that's just a common, uh, a common purpose of songs. And singing spiritual songs on the Lord's Day doesn't mean that every song has to be about the resurrection of Jesus, but if the resurrection of Jesus and the response to that that we've talked about, if that's already in our hearts before we assemble together or before we sing, then the, the table has been set. The, we have the, the reminders already that then, then our heart is responding to that when we sing. Look at Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Some people say, well, what, what are we going to do in heaven? And then sometimes, oh, we'll, we'll just kind of sing and pray. How, how do we do that for eternity? I don't know that that's all that we'll do for eternity, but part of it is that singing is a response to something. If you're just kind of singing a song that you hear on the radio, well, then you may end up singing a song that, that my spouse left me or my dog died or you know some other thing. You're, you're just kind of singing to be singing. You're not really responding to the words a lot of times. You're more responding to the, to the beat and the melody. Uh, it's okay to have a, a good beat or a melody, but the melody is not primarily what we are to respond to. And in Revelation 5, 9, and 10, uh, I'm sure it this is describing a beautiful melody that John heard, but as we read, this, this is not primarily a response to melody, is it? They sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. What, what are they responding to here? They, they're responding to the God who, whom they see. So why is it we can't totally grasp everything that we'll do in heaven? Well, for one, because God hasn't told us. <laughs> but then also, maybe it's, it's hard to grasp how many times we might sing because it's hard to grasp what, what we will see in heaven. But singing is always a response. Um, or, or in this case, at least, it, it is a response to something that we see or something that we know. Uh, I've, I've had, I remember one, one friend in particular saying, you know, I, when I come, I sing, but I, I really don't like to sing. I don't sing any other time. And there's some people that just really enjoy singing, others that don't. And this is just a reminder, you don't, you don't have to enjoy singing because it isn't first and foremost and primarily for you. So if you sing and you don't enjoy it, that's okay. <laughs> because the gift you may give to your spouse the gift you may give to a friend, you, you might hope nobody ever gave that to you. But that's okay, because the point is, and the hope is, you give it to them that they like it. And if they like it, if they accept it, then that, that's the point. And so, we, we don't, have to like, don't have to like to sing or enjoy it. If, if we do, that can, of course, add to it. But we are taught to sing, and if we choose not to sing... That, that also is a response to God. It's choosing not to give thanks. And that may indicate there's not gratitude in my heart. So how, how do spiritual creatures sing? I, before I was a, a preacher, I was a speech therapist, and so I had to study all about the vocal cords and all that. I, I know how a physical body makes a sound. How does a spiritual being make a sound? I, I don't know yet. But, but they do, and among the things that they do with their voices, in heaven even, is they give thanks to God. And so, think of that, of it in this context, that songs that give thanks to God on the Lord's Day. 
when they are a response to, among other things, when they are, are a response to the purpose of the reminders of the day, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's what makes the Lord's Day a Thanksgiving Day. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This, this also would, would be obvious, but when we give thanks in prayer on the Lord's Day, then that's part of what makes the Lord's Day a day of giving thanks. 1 Corinthians 14 also is not limited to the Lord's Day, but it is talking about when the saints came together in one place. In verse 15 he says, What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. He means praying in a way that those who hear can understand. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. Did you notice here there were three different, three different words uh, or uh, three different ways of, of describing prayer? If one is the word pray. Then in verse 15, bless. He says, if you bless with the Spirit. There, he's talking about the same. He's talking about prayer. And then at the end of verse 16 and 17, giving of thanks. Now, every prayer, of course, doesn't only have to involve giving thanks, but here that is such, that's such a part of prayer that it, giving thanks ends up being a, uh, a substitute for prayer itself. Blessing and giving thanks is just a way to say that they were praying. So we're not surprised that when they came together, they prayed. There are many reasons to pray. There are many days that we can pray. But when we come together, when we first come together to God, entering the holiest, and if there are other Christians, if there are other priests, in the new covenant sense that we gather together with, and we go before God, then wow, why would we not pray? And if we pray, then what would we be saying? We would be offering, at, l at the least, some words of thanks. That was also something that, that John was shown in the vision uh, that, that he saw in, Revela in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. Revelation chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. And just as songs are a response to something, then prayers are... Of course, likewise, it says all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Now that, that's, that's a rather short prayer and doesn't go into a lot of detail, uh, but this is a, a, a prayer of praise, and included in the praise here uh, are words of thanksgiving. And so like singing, what will we do in heaven? Well, well, we'll sing, and then here we see words that are expressed to God prayer. And again, sometimes the thought is, people, well, how would I do that for, forever? That, that might be kind of boring. And again, it, it is hard to understand, because there's a whole lot we don't understand about eternity and about seeing God and however He allows us to do that, there is a lot we don't understand. But another part of that is, well, that seems boring, as some people say it. Part of it's because we also take for granted uh, the, the blessing of being able to speak. Um, sometimes that is impressed on us, impressed upon us if we or someone we know loses their ability to speak. Can you imagine? not being able to speak. You can think, but you, you can't express it. Again, in, in my work as a speech therapist, I, I saw people like that who sometimes temporarily, sometimes permanently lost the ability to say anything out of their mouth. If you think of it in that context, then the ability to speak takes on a little more significance. And then think of the ability to speak to the King, to the Creator, the One who has given you every blessing that you can count, and I think as 
maybe was mentioned in, in, the, ta- in the, the prayer earlier by Taylor, that there are even things we, we overlook or we forget to count or that we can't, can't even notice. Well, if our blessings are, that, are, are of that nature, then is it valuable and worthwhile to you to have the opportunity to stand face to face with the one who gave those things and could you ever exp- have enough words and ever express them deeply and sincerely enough to just to be satisfied so while speech and praying and singing seems like uh, ra- something rather ordinary uh, the fact is that most of the things that we participate in on this earth are something that are going to be limited to this earth, and when we leave this earth, we'll never do those things again. And that's worth considering. How valuable are they if we're only doing them for such a short period of time and we will never do them again throughout all eternity? Well then, what's the importance of those as compared to things that God has decided decided would be preserved and would be continued for eternity? And so we can... Of course, and ought to give thanks always, every day, for a variety of reasons. But can you see that on the day that we visit the memorial of Jesus' resurrection, well then the words, our, our, heart, our, our hearts are prepared to give thanks. And then when we give thanks on the Lord's day, that makes it, among other things, a day of thanksgiving. And then just one more, we may continue this, this study another time, but for tonight, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And so think about giving in the same context. When we give thanks to God by giving as we've been blessed, and when we do that in the context of the Lord's day, then that's a part of what makes the Lord's day a thanksgiving day. The New Testament is is brief. If you took the number of passages in the New Testament about uh, financial giving um, uh, in, in regards to the church, there's, there's not a long list of passages. But of course, that doesn't mean it isn't important because as we also saw, even there's only one verse that even talks about the Lord's Day in, in that specific way. But we have that one passage about the Lord's Day that helps us. We have this passage, 1 Corinthians 16, Let's read verses 1 and 2. Paul says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Paul makes it clear in the following verses, and even in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, the church in Corinth had made this commitment. They had heard about the needs of the saints in Jerusalem. And so they had decided they were going to to help relieve the needs of the saints there. And the way that they were going to do that was by sending funds. So how is the church going to send funds? First, they have to have some funds. So how is the church going to have anything to give or to share? Well, they would have had a lot of different uh, methods of fundraising. Uh, what about selling copies of the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians? Would anybody buy it? Well, if you have a Bible, you, you did. Uh, because you know this is not just a few personal letters sent to friends. Paul said the things that I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Would you like to have a copy of the commandments of the Lord? Well, that, that would be of some value. So is the church in Corinth going to raise funds by everybody getting together and we're going to copy this letter that Paul sent and then we'll sell it to anybody that, that's interested in having their own copy. They didn't do that. Uh, Paul, you know, was a tent maker. What if Paul made some tents and then donated them to the church and then the church sold some tents? They didn't do that. We don't read in the New Testament church ever, churches ever being in the, in the business of tent selling. I suppose there were some good cooks in Corinth. What about having some of the ladies cook some, uh, some goods and bake, uh, maybe sew, and then the church sell those things? Don't read that. How about bingo night? 
Uh, casinos in America d did not invent gambling. There, there was gambling in the first century. The church going to raise some raise some funds by by that? No. How is the church going to have anything if if the church needs to share something? Well, let each one of you lay something aside, and they they could do that on a variety of occasions. Is it incidental? Is it an accident or unimportant, an unimportant detail that Paul says do this on the first day of the week? That built into that phrase is all that we've talked about. It's, we, we could read it just the same if he said, on the Lord's day, let each one of you lay something aside. On the day that Jesus arose from the dead, let each one of you lay something aside. Now, does that take the activity beyond just dropping something in a, in a basket. It's the activity, but the activity is done on the day. You see, you can, you can go shoot, fire, shoot fireworks any time, any time of the year, any day of the year, and it's, it's enjoyable. But if you shoot fireworks on the 4th of July, it adds a little color and context to it, doesn't it? Giving on the first day of the week, giving something on the day that... Jesus was given back to the earth on the day that He was raised from the dead adds something to what we're doing. In 2 Corinthians, on the, Paul writes them later, and he's writing on exactly the same subject, uh, the help that they had committed to offer. They had not yet uh, uh, given that to Paul. He was going to be simply delivering it as their messenger. And so he says, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. What, what makes a cheerful giver? Well, it's more blessed to give than to receive. That, that's good. God promised He would bless the one who gave. That would be a reason. What about knowing why I'm giving and what it's going to be used for? Well, that, that, that adds another layer of, of cheer to the one who gives. Uh, just by virtue of, if I have something to give, that should produce cheerful giving. Maybe someone couldn't set anything aside because they didn't have anything to set aside. And so if I have something to give, that would make me a cheerful giver. And so... Paul didn't say that we have to use a basket. Uh, Paul didn't say we, we had to pray before we do it. He didn't say we have to read a scripture or we have to make even any, any comment before we share in this way. But since the goal of gathering together is to stir one another up to love and good works, then could we, already coming with cheerful hearts, could we be stirred up to love and good works by a prayer or a song? or a comment, or a scripture before we give. Those, those are all appropriate. So, my point is God has given us lots of reasons to, to be cheerful givers. And though there's little said about giving in the New Testament, uh, there's even less that's said about giving with thanks. But don't you think that's built in? <laughs> when God tells us to give, then it's kind of built into that. You should give with thanksgiving. And then on top of that, it is no accident that we are instructed to give this way on this day, on a day that we could call a thanksgiving day. So we think about the teaching. We can think about breaking bread. We might, might do that in, in another, another study. But I think you get the point. Every first day of the week is the Lord's Day. The day is a memorial of, uh, of an event that we're familiar with, uh, so it's easy to know. And so sometimes our, our mind, our emotions don't react to it the, exactly the same way that, that Mary did when she came to the tomb, or to the disciples did, that the disciples did when they first heard the news. And so God gives us this uh, opportunity to discipline ourselves, to put, make the things that are familiar and that our routine, uh, that they would not be vainly re repetitious in us. We, 
We all may make some sacrifices Thursday to be with family, to be with friends, just because we're Americans. Even more so, let's make it a weekly habit, not rote, but a, a weekly habit to give thanks to God, by worshiping God on the Lord's Day. This is not a tradition of man. This is a, a tradition that God has given to us. Take out your songbooks, turn to number 375. We could sing this song uh, on any day for a variety of reasons, but the fact that it is the Lord's Day just adds something in addition to the thrust and, and the focus of the song. So as we sing this song, think about the fact that Jesus arose on this day. Think about the theme uh, of this song. Think about your conscience and your soul and your eternity. If you're here tonight and you know that there is no hope without Jesus because of His death, uh, with, without Jesus and His death and His resurrection, if there's anyone here tonight ready to confess their faith and to be baptized, uh, we want to help you if we can in that way or in some other way in serving Him. Uh, if not, this song will serve, if it's from our hearts, to stir us up to love and good works. Let's prepare our hearts for that this week. If we can serve you in any way tonight, please tell us how as we sing together. <laughs> 